Okay, you'll notice um, on the projector here, I have a scene. This is available in the classic content. Um, and you see a stained glass window on a wall. And if we were to look at this, let me put this aside. This is camera view. Let's just look at this at perspective for a moment. So we have an interior light. We have a window. And if we look at the back of the window and we zoom out, you'll see that there's also a light being projected from behind. Okay. Now, if we also, if we look at the window, let's spin this back around. This is texture shaded. And if you look at the window, it just looks like an empty window. But in fact, if we look at our surface editor and you look at window, you'll see under basic here that there is a texture that's been added. That's projection. It looks like a stained glass window. window. So it's just a planar JPEG. You know, it's a, it's a planar projection, and it's just a simple JPEG that's being projected. Okay. You'll notice that transparency has been added so that it does make it a real transparent window, you know, like stained glass would be. 50%, not 80%, as you would see with, regu with regular glass. Bump maps could be added and reflections and specularity and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, they've just done that. So let's go back over, and I'm going to, this is the final rendering, but I'm just going to render it again to show you what um, it looks like. Because this is what it looks like in, your, in OpenGL. And then when we render a frame, you'll see from the light shining behind, and the fact that the window is 50% transparent, light should be able to, to transfer or go through it, right? So we'll go ahead and I'll render the frame. You can see, that's what this is down here. It's not a shadow, it's the light that's projected through the window. Okay. Three passes, four passes, and you get the idea, because it's already here. Okay, so you see the image that's, that's been used as a projection map for the window, transparent. Light on the other side of the, of the wall projects light through here. But what you want to be able to do in an instance like this is that in the real world, not only would it project light through here, but the colors would be projected through here as well, wouldn't they? So on the ground, you would see the, um, the stained glass projected on here, just like that light is projecting onto here. And this is part of your, your mapping. So what we want to do is come back to the window. And this time, we're going to look at advanced. So this is one of the first times that we've switched to, gone from basic to an advanced tab here. And there is a bunch of features in here that if you wanted to add glow maps and all kinds of stuff, that we could do that so that features would glow. What we're interested in here is color filter right down here. It's a second one from the top. We have color highlights, color filter, Additive transparency, diffuse sharpness, all this other stuff. Color filter is the main one, and it's currently set to zero. I'm going to crank this all the way up to 100. Now watch what happens when I render the frame. So I'll come back, and I'll render the frame. Notice that the stained glass now, with the light shining through, is projected onto the floor. Pretty cool, huh? Very simple feature, but <coughs> in that particular, in this particular situation, can make all the difference in the world in making your scene look pretty believable. So there we have. It. <coughs> so now you can see that the stained glass, the light shining through it, is projected onto the floor. That's all it takes, and it's as long as you know that it's there. And you're going to forget, because I forget, where this is located, you know. But as long as you know that that's what you need to do, that you need to do something in order for that to happen, and that's an important part. <coughs> okay? So that's one thing I want to show you. 
The other thing that I want to do is use the camera <coughs> as a projection to, to project images onto surfaces. And this is used oftentimes in compositing. And a little bit later, what we'll do is we'll, we'll develop a scene. And they actually had one as a tutorial on version 6. There was a bathroom, <coughs> and they had a picture of, of a bathroom. Well, there's the tub, you know, you have the tub. And what they did is they developed a spray bottle, you know, a cleaner that was to be set on top of this photograph of this tub. But if you've noticed so far, if you've used an image for your background and rendered it, that when the object casts a shadow, it doesn't cast it on the background, does it? Background is a background. It's a separate element. But what if you wanted to integrate the background with your image? Does am I making sense to everybody? Okay. Okay, what you would need to do then, <coughs> and what they had in this tutorial, and that we'll do later on <coughs> in this class, is that <coughs> they created kind of a, a, a little block. It was just a rectangle that represented the edge of the tub. Okay? So it matched pretty closely the perspective of that tub. And that was all that needed to be created. And then projected on the side of that was the background image, but it had to be projected through the camera to match the perspective that you saw on the back. And then when you had the spray bottle on top of that edge of the ledge of the tub and it cast a shadow, it cast, it, cast the shadow on that block. And you could see it, the shadow as well as the projection on there. So it looked like it was actually in the environment. And you see that in film now all the time, in commercials, in movies, where 3D, the 3D <coughs> CG component is seamless with the live action. And so that can be really nice that you build your toy, you build whatever, a scene, and you're not going to build every little element so maybe part of it is that you have a, a nice background image. You build some dummy parts where you want shadows to be, or even just a simple ground plane so that the object that's in the scene casts a shadow that looks like it's actually in the scene. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this scene. Everybody's seen this. It's a stained glass, and I'm going to go back to Modeler. And we're just going to create something very, a, a simple sphere, cylinder or something, and it doesn't really matter. I'll go ahead and I'll make a sphere. Okay. And reset, activate, and that's all there is to it. That's all I want. Now what I'm going to do, <coughs> under basic textures, let me go ahead and hit Q. <coughs> I'm going to leave it a white surface, but I'm going to name it ball or sphere or something like that. Okay, so this is what we have. Maybe I could add a little bit of a color to it just for the heck of it. Make it slightly orange or red or something. I want, it, want you to be able to see what's going on here. I'll make it green. Okay. Now what I want to do is project something onto it. So I'll hit T. So far we've used planar, cylindrical, spherical, cubic, but we have not used front or UV maps yet. This time I'm going to use a UV projection. I mean, I'm sorry, UV, a front projection. Let me load an image. <coughs> I'm just going to find any old image that's on the side here. Um, let me go back to the hard drive, look at applications, scroll down to Lightwave 8. Let's look in content. Let's look in classic content. Let's look in images. Let's scroll down here and let's look at what do I want to look at. You know what? Since I'm doing this, I'm going to leave, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than what I had planned. <coughs> I'm 
I'm going to try and blend this with the environment just to show you the composite component. So let me change the color of this to a nice bright red. And what I also want to do now is put a ground plane in here. So this is red. I'm going to have one of the photographs that we used before for reflections, maybe the river scene or something like that, be a part of the background. We'll render it that way and I want to put in a ground plane and use the front projection onto that so then we can actually have a shadow of the ball cast in the scene so it looks like it's in actually in that environment. Okay. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to create the box tool and just like so. <coughs> Take this off and while this is selected Let's go ahead, polygons, oh shoot, what am I doing, oh there we go, polygons, Q, we'll call it ground, <coughs> and I'll just leave it white for right now, it's okay. Let's save it, save object as, and we'll call it all composite. Okay. Um, I need to go back to the desktop and I need to save it in my content folder here. So this is under objects. <coughs> Deselect and now let's go ahead and send this over to layout. And notice that I have two, an object that's really shouldn't be separated this way. It should be separate objects, but you get, you'll get the idea in a minute. So let me look at um, camera view. <coughs> let me go ahead and raise this. Actually, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to move the camera is what I wanted to do. Let's rotate the camera. Move the camera, zoom in so we can see this like so. Now let's go ahead and render the frame. Do I have shadows turned on? I guess not. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at render options. And I don't have anything turned on. And I want to make sure the image viewer, viewer is here. Let's render it one more time. <coughs> there we go. <coughs> Now what I need to do, I'll go ahead and abort that since that's in here, is I want to put in a background image. So we'll go to Window, Backdrop Options, and I'm going, to go on, I'm going to switch from Backdrop, Simple Color or Gradient Color, to Compositing. I want to bring in a backdrop image now. So let's load the image. Go back. <coughs> we'll go back to Desktop. Go back to... Oh, come on. I didn't want to go. I just want to go to the hard drive. Never mind. Applications. Lightwave 8. Content. Classic content. Images. And that's look down here. And photos. And this river one is, would be a pretty good example, okay? Or maybe the sandbar maybe would be better because I want the ball to look like it's in the scene casting the shadow <coughs> onto the sand or the water or something like that. This isn't going to be a perfect match, but you'll get the idea <coughs> because if I click open now <coughs> and we render this, it's pretty much what you might expect because we have the ground plane in here. Okay, um, just looks like there's a big flat gray thing sitting in, in the um, in the scene with a ball on it, and it's not seated on the <coughs> the um, you know inside the scene at all. Okay, so I'm going to change the way that this plane has a surface. 
I'm going to take this image that I've used for the background and I'm going to use front projection since this almost matches the perspective. This plane has to match the perspective of what I have in here. It can be something very simple like this. So I'll go ahead and abort this since I'm done. Close effects. <coughs> now I have under surface editor, I have ground. I'm going to go back to basic, click on texture, and instead of planar, I'm going to use front projection. And we already have the sandbar. I'll select that. And now let's go ahead and close and let's render the frame and see how close I've got. Okay. It looks like it's in the scene, but now you still see part of that of the, the ground plane, but you see the image, how it matches perfectly in here. It looks like it's actually on, you know, in this scene, doesn't it? But you still see this ground plane. So what we need to do to fix that is on this particular surface, we need to play with the luminosity to actually look like light is being projected through it to make this ground plane here a little bit brighter and more intense. And this is where you have to tinker with this and play with it so that it matches the background. So let's go ahead and I'm going to select the ground. I'm going to go ahead and crank luminosity up to maybe 25%. Is that enough or is it too much? I don't have a clue. The only way I can do that is to render it, the scene again, and when they match, then I know I've added enough luminosity. So I'll render the frame again. Not enough. It's getting looking a little better. Abort. Let's turn it up to 50% and see if that pushes it up to where we need it to be. Okay, let's go back and render the frame again. It's a little bit too light now. So now I got to dial it back, but you get the idea. <coughs> and now you can see. What about transparency? What about transparency? Huh? No, it, transparency won't help it. No, because then it would also make the projection that you have. Because on a reflective surface, like it, there are shadows that are cast, but they're very light. And this you would want to be a little bit more intense. But it actually looks like it's in the scene now. And you want your light <coughs> to mat pretty much match the light in the scene. So if you have, you know, if, if it's an interior scene, what kind of incandescent lights are there? What kind of <coughs> fluorescent lights, whatever. And there you have it. So this is something that for your toy piece, um, if you, uh, when I talk about lights on Wednesday, there's a light stage that's available to all of you that you're more than welcome to use that sets up a neutral environment with, with a seamless backdrop. It's actually kind of in a bowl, so you don't see the edges of rooms normally. Have you ever seen in a photographer's studio where they have what is called seamless and it's just a big sheet of paper that <coughs> rolls out onto the, from the wall onto the floor and it curves so there's no abrupt corner to catch light? So it looks almost like an infinite plane. Well, that's what this bowl serves as. And they've got the lighting set up really nice. So it, it's, and we'll go over each of the lights that they've used, the different kinds of lights. It's a neutral environment. It's almost, it is a, a stage setting the way you would set it up inside a photographer's studio. <coughs> really very nice. So it's good for product shots. If you have a car, you have whatever it is, your toy that you're making, you want to showcase it just the way it is, or it would be in an ideal situation that you would see in an ad. <coughs> On the other hand, maybe if you want to take the toy and you want to put it into an environment, whether it be a photograph of a room, like I was describing that bathroom scene, 
with the object on a tub. Maybe you're doing a rubber ducky or something, you know, and it's inside the tub and you want it to look like it's really inside the tub. That would be one way of doing it. If you want it to look like it's on the beach like this, um, you don't need to build a beach. You just need a photograph of the beach and then we need to create a plane that matches the perspective. <coughs> Use front projection of that background image onto the plane and then adjust luminosity until this matches. And so I would dial it back now and I went from 25 to 50, now I'll go back to maybe 40, and then 30, you know, until you get a perfect match. And it will, it, it takes several renderings, but it's getting closer. And now, if you had a really ripply surface, you would probably want to put a bump map onto that surface so that the shadows that were cast onto it really sort of mirrored what you had. So you just have to get a pretty close approximation of what that surface is that's going to be projected onto it so that the shadows that are cast onto it will match or look like they match the photograph. Pretty cool though, huh? It really makes a huge difference. I mean, there's all kinds of little, excuse me, tricks like this. So, style this to 40. Let me render this again <coughs> and see what we have. That's pretty close. There you go. So it looks like it's in the scene. We can come back here again, look at the sphere, maybe use smoothing so it smooths it. We can turn up anti-aliasing so we don't see the, the jaggies in the shadow. <coughs> if you wanted a softer light, you know, we can back off on the, the distant light that's used by default. Um, depending on the kind of lighting, you know, I mean, distant lights try to, to mimic an, the sun, but sometimes the sh in, in harsh light, you will see, um, you know, outdoors, you will see a really strong shadow like this. But you'll notice that not much is casting a shadow around here. It's pretty bleached out, so we would probably want to dial the, the intensity of the sun back a little bit so it's not casting quite harsh a shadow. But shadows are important in scenes, important in drawings, important in whatever you're doing, especially in 3D. <clears throat> and the reason I say that, anybody had basic drawing class? A couple, okay. And what did your drawing teachers tell you about shadows? Anything? There's two things that I can think of. Well, shadows help define the, the volume. For example, <clears throat> if I'm standing, you know, like the, <clears throat> I have my knee up, and I have my arm across like this, and the sh you know the light streaming across my arm, and my arm casts a shadow on the leg. That shadow, as it wraps around my leg, just the shadow by itself helps to define the form. That you see my leg is a cylindrical, is a cylinder, just by looking at the shadow. So um, shadows do a lot in helping define the three-dimensional properties of what you're seeing. They really help it make it look more three-dimensional. It also, as you see here, it anchors it in an environment. Whether it's floating or it's actually sitting on a surface, it puts it there. Without the shadows, it clearly it looks, you know, in relation to everything else, it looks like something is missing, doesn't it? So it anchors it and it puts it in that environment. So that's two things that I can think of offhand. Um, I know, you know, from art school, you know, taking life drawing classes, one of the exercises that we would do, because they would always set up <coughs> still lifes or <coughs> models with really harsh lights. So you got really strong cast shadows. And one way of drawing is to just draw the shadows and nothing else. And you would be surprised it how, how the form emerges from just drawing shadows and nothing else, if it's lighted properly. It's amazing how much it's defined. If you look at some old time illustrators, the old time, they were very popular in my day, like Mark English and Bart Forbes and a number of these people. They would um, 
<coughs> really that was what they emphasized when they drew people. It was really s very stylized the way that they drew them. They looked very three-dimensional, but how they emphasized the three-dimensional properties of the characters or the people that they were drawing is really accentuate the shadows and really carefully design those shapes when they drew them. And now you don't have to draw them, but you do have to set up your lights in such a way and, and your, your stage, you know, stage everything in such a way that you do have strong shadows, you know, that, that will help do just what I explained to make, since we're working in 3D, make everything look 3D. If you overlight your scene, and I'm kind of jumping ahead to what we're going to talk about Wednesday, if you overlight your scene, it bleaches everything out <coughs> and it looks very flat. If you, um, the worst time to take a photograph would be in the middle of the summer at noon, you know, when the sun's directly overhead and there are no shadows and everything is just bleached out white. Everything looks horrible when you get those photographs back, you know. It looks better early in the morning, late in the afternoon. When the sun's going down, strong shadows, light isn't so intense, colors are more vibrant. Now, that's really what you sort of want to create here. And some of you already discovered that when you did the table and lamp. You know, you turned the project in and you had just put a little light in the lamp, turned off all the other lights. And it really created, doing very little, a very strong mood, kind of an ambiance that you would find. And, um, that is what I find to be, for myself, really effective in 3D. You can do, you know, start with a good strong model. It could be simple. Make sure that you really surface it properly so it looks like the surfaces in the real world. And then light it. And it's better, as I said, to underlight it than to overlight it. And you really create really a strong um, scene and a strong three-dimensional looking object by doing those three things. Those are really three important components. Modeling is really important, but you can get away with a lot with a mediocre model with really good, you know, simple model, but strong surfacing, which we're emphasizing on this project, and then really good lighting. It will really showcase your, your project more than you can uh, ima imagine just by changing those features. So, and the same, you know, when I talk about lighting, um, Everybody been to Disneyland? Okay, and you go in the dark rides and they're lighted. <coughs> when you see those during the day, it's like, it's horrible. It's like going into, you know, when you go into a dimly lit bar, they look kind of neat, but you turn on the lights and you really don't want to see, you know, you don't want to eat in there, you don't want to see what's going on. It's the same with the dark rides. It's amazing what they use for special effects and things like that. Really, really pretty humdrum in a lot of cases and pretty boring looking and pretty blah. Um, it really comes alive in those attractions at Disneyland when they're lighted properly. They really, I mean, pirates, you name it, they all are really pretty spectacular. And the people who do that are paid well. The people who, I don't know how well they're paid these days in, in, model, in, in the 3D world that we're working in. But people who do the modeling, it is a real special, it's, a, it's an area of specialization. Not too many people want to do it, um, but it's one that's absolutely necessary these days. And that would be, if you want to get into this, doing this professionally, that might be a good inroad. It's to start in the technical area and to focus on lighting. What would also help too is to um, take a, a course in the theater department stage production and stuff to know, learn how to light a scene and that will really help a lot. Or a photography class to learn how to light, properly light individuals, environments. And all of that will translate directly into what we're doing in this, you know, virtual 3, 3D environment. So anyway, and we have a ball on the side of the beach and it looks like it's in the beach. So if you want to do this for the toy, that would be pretty cool. <coughs> or as I said well, on Wednesday when I show you that light stage, if you want to put your toy in that light stage, that will be a, a, a different kind of environment, but that will be pretty nice too. And I think it will really help to showcase your, your piece so that it you know, would be a good portfolio piece when you're done. Okay? That's all I wanted to cover today. Um, the rest of today is a work day.